chapter 16, verse 29. In the 38th year of Asa, king of Judah, Ahab, son of Omri, became king of Israel, and he reigned in Samaria over Israel for 22 years. Ahab, son of Omri, did more evil in the eyes of the Lord than any of those before him. He not only considered it trivial to commit the sins of Jeroboam, son of Nebat, but he also married Jezebel, daughter of Ethbaal, king of the Sidonians, and began to serve Baal and worship him. He set up an altar for Baal in the temple of Baal that he built in Samaria. Ahab also made an Asherah pole and did more to arouse the anger of the Lord, the God of Israel, than did all the kings of Israel before him. In Ahab's time, Hiel of Bethel rebuilt Jericho. He laid its foundations at the cost of his firstborn son, Abiram, and he set up its gates at the cost of his youngest son, Segub in accordance with the word of the Lord spoken by Joshua, son of Nun. Now, Elijah, the Tishbite from Tishbe in Gilead, said to Ahab, As the Lord, the God of Israel, lives, whom I serve, there will be neither dew nor rain in the next few years except at my word. Then the word of the Lord came to Elijah, Leave here, turn eastward, and hide in the Kerith ravine east of the Jordan. You will drink from the brook, and I've instructed the ravens to supply you with food there. So he did what the Lord had told him. He went to the Kerith Ravine, east of the Jordan, and stayed there. The ravens brought him bread and meat in the morning, and bread and meat in the evening, and he drank from the brook. Sometime later, the brook dried up, because there had been no rain in the land. Then the word of the Lord came to him, Go at once to Zarephath, in the region of Sidon, and stay there. I have instructed a widow there to supply you with food. So he went to Zarephath. When he came to the town gate, a widow was there gathering sticks. He called to her and asked, Would you bring me a little water in a jar so I may have a drink? As she was going to get it, he called, And bring me, please, a piece of bread. As surely as the Lord your God lives, she replied, I don't have any bread, only a handful of flour in a jar and a little olive oil in a jug. I'm gathering a few sticks to take home and make a meal for myself and my son that we may eat it and die. Elijah said to her, don't be afraid, go home and do as you have said, but first make a small loaf of bread for me from what you have and bring it to me and then make something for yourself and your son. For this is what the Lord, the God of Israel says. The jar of flour will not be used up and the jug of oil will not run dry until the day the Lord sends rain on the land. She went away and did as Elijah had told her, so there was food every day for Elijah, and for the woman and her family. For the jar of flour was not used up, and the jug of oil did not run dry, in keeping with the word of the Lord spoken by Elijah. Sometime later, the son of the woman who owned the house became ill. He grew worse and worse, and finally stopped breathing. She said to Elijah, what do you have against me, man of God? Did you come to remind me of my sin and kill my son? Give me your son, Elijah replied. He took him from her arms, carried him to the upper room where he was staying, and laid him on his bed. Then he cried out to the Lord, Lord my God, have you brought tragedy even on this widow I am staying with by causing her son to die? Then he stretched himself out on the boy three times and cried out to the Lord, Lord, my God, let this boy's life return to him. The Lord heard Elijah's cry, and the boy's life returned to him, and he lived. Elijah picked up the child and carried him down from the room into the house. He gave him to his mother and said, Look, your son is alive. Then the woman said to Elijah, Now I know that you are a man of God, and that the word of the Lord from your mouth is the truth. Well, let me add my welcome to Mark's. Thanks for coming out. Sorry about the heating being off. We're getting it worked on. It'll be warm by next week. So we're calling this series Faith in a Secular Age. And much has been made about secularization in the UK, in the West in general. Um, It would be fair to say that a lot is um, made of it, but actually the the reality is a bit uh, more nuanced on the ground. A phrase that I've come across that I think adequately describes it is that a lot of people today are what um, could be called as fuzzy nuns. 
It amuses me a little bit, you know, talking about secularization to call someone fuzzy nuns. And what they mean by that is not nun as in N-U-N, but nun as in N-O-N-E. Um, so when people are filling out a survey about their religious belief, they will often tick none. I have no religious belief. But it's fuzzy in that it's not so straightforward because spirituality is still very prevalent. And actually, secularization in straight terms is dealing with not just a decline in religious belief, but the way a decline in membership of institutions in general is, in, is, um, uh, is affecting religions. And so people often have baseline spiritual or kind of informal religious beliefs, even if they would say that they themselves don't hold any formal affiliation to religion. Either way, however you, um, you know, document it and whatever you would call yourself here today, whether you would call yourself a Christian, um, someone looking into it, a fuzzy nun uh, maybe, one of the questions is how do you live out your faith in an age which is increasingly, and I don't think we can deny that, increasingly secular? Perhaps you're a Christian worker here today and you're trying to work out whether or not your faith has any implications for your work. Should you do what is often said in UK society and keep your faith private? It's fine for you, but don't bring it into the workplace. That wouldn't be appropriate. Faith is not to be brought into the public forum, we're often told. Is that right? Is that wrong? Should you be seeking to tell people about your faith to give them an opportunity to investigate it or just leave well enough alone as HR will often tell you to do? If you're a person coming and investigating, is faith plausible in a so-called secular age or is it implausible? These are the type of questions which we're going to be thinking through as we go through 1, 1 Kings. And whilst it wasn't completely secular in Elijah's day, Elijah knew something about feeling the sense that he was in the minority. There were only 7,000 believers in the northern kingdom of Israel at that time. And what is striking as we come to the end of chapter 16 is just how quickly the situation has changed. We go back only about 50 or 60 years and we get one of the high points in the reigns of the kings of Israel, where Solomon is king over Israel. And Solomon being king, his fame is spread throughout the world. Now Ahab's reign, this is about 874 BC to 853 BC when these events are going on, but the glory days of Israel were less than a couple of generations earlier. You remember the story, you probably know of it. The Queen of Sheba coming from Africa across to Israel to see the glory and the wonder and the splendor and the wisdom of Solomon, a man given wisdom by God, living under God's word, and as a result, the kingdom of God flourishing and the fame of it spreading throughout the earth. But how quickly the situation changes. By chapter 11, spiritual idolatry is starting to creep into the nation of Israel as they start to reject God word, God's word. Civil war breaks out. The nation splits in two, the northern kingdom, ten tribes of Israel, the southern kingdom, two tribes making up Judah. And in the northern kingdom here where we have all the action, there are six kings in quick succession, one after the other over a period of just 50 years or so, each one getting worse and worse and worse in the evil they're committing and in the idolatry they're leading the people of God into. And in that section, we get a key theme coming about. And the key theme is the word of the Lord. Look down with me and you'll see that it comes up a number of times in our passage. Chapter 16, verse 34 on page 358. Look down towards the end of that little brief paragraph. In accordance with the word of the Lord spoken by Joshua, son of Nun. Look down, chapter 17, verse 2. Then the word of the Lord came to Elijah. Chapter 17, verse 8. Then the word of the Lord came to him. Chapter 17, verse 16, just across the, um, the page. For the jar of flowers not used up and the jug of oil did not run dry, in keeping with the word of the Lord spoken by Elijah. And then the climax at the end of the passage, almost the turnaround. Then the woman said to Elijah, Now I know that you are a man of God and that the word of the Lord from your mouth is the truth. You see the theme there, the word of the Lord? Well, we're going to pick up on that and see how the passage shows us, first of all, the problem is caused by rejection of God's word, and that's in chapter 16, 24 to 17, verse 1. So at the end of chapter 16, we have this rejection of God's word. It's implied more than stated, but all of the readers would get it, and it particularly is shown in the reign of King Ahab. I mean, look at verse 30 as he is described. It is a horrible description, isn't it? Ahab, son of Omri, did more evil 
in the eyes of the Lord than any of those before him. Verse 31, he not only considered it trivial to commit the sins of Jeroboam, son of Nabat, and then it went on to list some further problems. Incidentally, Jeroboam had previously been described as the person who up till that point committed more evil than any other king. Ahab is described as one who considers it trivial just to do that. In other words, he's even worse. He's the worst of the worst. And you'll know there's a a note of foreboding when we're told that he marries Jezebel. I mean, the term in the vernacular is hardly a complimentary one, isn't it? Here is King Ahab. He trivializes sin, verse 31. He thinks that it's not a problem to do whatever he wants. And he turns to idolatry, verse 32. He set up an altar for Baal in the temple of Baal that he built in Samaria. Now, you might be thinking, okay, well, in a religiously pluralistic age, isn't it fine for you? If you want to worship Baal, that's fine. I mean, it might not be something people do today. After all, Baal was just a Hebrew fertility god. uh, Sorry, a Canaanite um, fertility god. What's the big problem with that? Well, Baal was a particularly unsavory character. The way that it normally worked was that in order to induce life-giving blessings from Baal, you had to give a life, normally that of your children. So here is this Canaanite fertility god that demands the sacrifice of your children to bring blessings on the land. This is pagan idolatry at its very worst. And how quickly it's all gone wrong. And beneath it all, we're supposed to see there's a rejection of God's word because what is the first commandment in the Ten Commandments? You shall have no other gods before me. So effectively, number one in the commands of the word of the Lord is having no other gods. And here is the king of God's people having another god. And a horrendous god at that. See how quickly it's gone wrong. Well, similarly, one of the features of our secular age is that as we turn away from God, I want us to see that like God's people here, Once we turn away from the true and living God and turn away from his word, we do not turn to neutrality. We do not turn to nothing else. We turn to anything else. I remember a few years ago chatting to a friend of mine who um, was looking into Christianity. He was doing a PhD in biology at Oxford, bright boy. And um, when I was speaking to him, I said, Charlie, where are you up to? You've been thinking about it for a number of months now. He said, I've been doing a lot of thinking. I've really carefully thought about it. I've read a lot of books. I've come to the conclusion I am an agnostic. And I just burst out laughing. And he looked at me rather confused. I said, Charlie, that's the one thing you can't be. If you've done all this reading and you've looked into it carefully, you can't say you don't know. You definitely know. You know something. You're not neutral. You're rejecting something. You're taking up a position. So it is with worship. The human heart is wired to worship. Neutrality is not an option. And so, in our secular age, you will see that the language of worship is everywhere, from the sports arenas, to the musical theatres, to the newspapers and magazines we read. Worship, adoration, praise, glory, the language of worship is everywhere because we are not neutral, we are still worshipping. We're not worshipping the true and living God, we are worshipping lesser gods, idols. We are all wired to worship. Materialism individualism, career, popularity, beauty, relationships, things which are not bad in and of themselves, hear me correctly on that, just as fertility and harvest was not bad in Ahab's day, but things which if we choose to define ourselves by them, to make them our ultimate source of identity, to make them ultimately important in our lives, they become little gods in our lives and they demand huge sacrifices from us and they lead us astray because here's the truth. In the real world, when you think carefully about it, everybody worships something. Bob Dylan put it like this. You may be an ambassador to England or France. You might like to gamble. You might like to dance. You may be the heavyweight champion of the world. You might be a socialite with a long string of pearls, but you're going to have to serve somebody. Yes, indeed. You're going to have to serve somebody. It may be the devil or it may be the Lord, but you're going to have to serve somebody. And so in our secular age, as it was in Ahab's day, there was no neutrality. Everybody is serving somebody or something. And look at the consequences. Verse 34, terrible consequences. In Ahab's time, Heel of Bethel rebuilt Jericho. He laid its foundation at the cost of his firstborn son, Abiram. And he set up its gates at the cost of his youngest son, Segub, in accordance with the word of the Lord spoken by Joshua, son of Nun. 
God had prophesied to Joshua that Jericho, this seat of idolatry, a city that was defined in many ways by pagan idolatry, was not to be rebuilt, and that if it was rebuilt, there would be a just judgment on the firstborn of whoever did that. And they disregard God's word that you can find in Joshua chapter 6, and they face the consequences. And then look at 17 verse 1. Now Elijah the Tishabite from Tishbe and Gilead said to Ahab, As the Lord, the God of Israel, lives, whom I serve, there will be neither dew nor rain in the next few years except at my word. Do you see what's going on here? They have turned to a false god of the harvest and of fertility. And the judgment that comes from that is you will have no harvest and you will have no fertility because false gods never deliver. We should know this with our idolatry. Dare I say it's the same today, if we turn away to the false gods of materialism, you'll always feel insecure. You'll always be looking at the Joneses and wondering how you can have more. You'll never have enough. It doesn't deliver. You turn to the false god of individualism. You'll die a thousand deaths as you feel lonely. You long for community, but you find yourself unable to really enter into meaningful community. Turn to the false god of your career, and you'll realize that your career will enslave you, that it will demand a hundred sacrifices on your family and your loved ones of you, and at the end of your career, you'll be left with a nice parting gift and an estranged family. Turn to the false god of beauty, and you'll die a thousand deaths as you get old and your beauty fades, and you no longer have the beauty of an inner spirit conformed to the likeness of God. Our idols never deliver. It was true in Ahab's day. It's true today as well. So is there any hope. Well, wonderfully, into this scene comes Elijah, a man of God who obeys the word of God and speaks the word of God, and there is hope. My second point, the blessing of God's word in chapter 17, verses 2 to 16. Look at verse 2. Then the word of the Lord came to Elijah. We may turn away from God and from his word, but God's word never departs from us. It's never stopped. Verse 5, look down. So Elijah did what the Lord had told him. It's amazing that the whole situation in this huge kingdom, northern kingdom of Israel, starts to turn around because of one solitary man, we'll find out there are a few others, but one solitary man who listens to God's word and who obeys God's word. Dare I say to you, if you're a Christian here today, that is how the Lord works. He turns things around by one person sometimes, obeying God's word and listening to God's word. Don't think you can't make an impact, you can, by God's grace. And look at verses 8 to 11. He's given a rather strange command, isn't he? The word of the Lord came to him, Go at once to Zarephath in the region of Sidon and stay there. I've instructed a widow there to supply you with food. So he went to Zarephath when he came to the town gate. A widow was there gathering sticks. He called to her and asked, Would you bring me a little water in a jar so I may have a drink? And she was going to get it, he called, and bring me, please, a piece of bread. Now, this is just bizarre. He's going out of the kingdom where surely you'd think that he's going to need to stay. He's out, he's going to the northern area of Sidon, outside of the northern kingdom of Israel. He's going to a Gentile woman. He's going to a woman with absolutely no influence in an ancient society. A widow had very little influence on society. And she's, as we'll find out, she's facing famine herself. Why is the Lord sending him there? It looks so strange. It looks so odd. He would be able to give you a hundred coherent reasons why he should not do this. But the word of the Lord tells him to do it, and so he does it. And this is the way that God starts to turn things around. He's directed to this widow, and the Lord tells him that actually she is going to supply her with food, but when he asks her for food, she gives a pretty devastating reply. She replies in verse 12, I don't have any bread, only a handful of flour in a jar and a little olive oil in a jug. I am gathering a few sticks to take home, make a meal for myself and my son, that we may eat it and die. She must have been starving for quite some time. She's got a tiny last bit of food left. She's emaciated. Her young son is emaciated. They've got nothing left. They're going home to die. And Elijah asks her for food? The Lord is strange sometimes. 
And yet, look at what happens. Verse 13, the Lord does a miracle. Elijah said to her, don't be afraid. Go home and do as you've said. But first make a small loaf of bread for me from what you have and bring it to me. So the last bit of food, she has to bring that. Verse 14, for this is what the Lord God of Israel says. The word of the Lord coming into the situation. The jar of flour will not be used up. In other words, it won't be your last. And the jug of oil will not run dry until the day the Lord sends rain on the land. No more need for Tesco delivery. Here is your jar of flour that constantly replenishes. Here is your jug of oil that constantly replenishes. And you can do a lot with a bit of flour and a bit of oil. And suddenly food comes into a situation of famine by the word of the Lord. And in a situation of starvation, do you see that this is, if you like, an illustration that the Lord God can bring food out of nothing? He's the Lord of the harvest, not this petty God Baal. There is only one God. He's the Lord of all. And with his word, he can turn around the situation and he can bring blessing into a situation of curse. What he does in the life of the widow, he can do for the nation of Israel if they will but turn back to him, if they will but do what God wants Elijah to do and Elijah is doing, obey his word, heed his word. The blessing of God's word and lastly, the life given by God's word. Elijah stays for a bit, and then tragically one day the son becomes ill and dies. And notice how Elijah responds in verse 20. No stoicism, no dispassionate display here. Verse 20, he cried out to the Lord. But also notice that Elijah does not lose faith in God. Verse 21, he says, Lord my God, let this boy's life return to him. So he mourns and he cries out to God, and that's always the the response of authentic faith. And verse 22 to 24, look what happens. Then the Lord heard Elijah's cry, and the boy's life returned to him, and he lived. Elijah picked up the child and carried him down from the room into the house, and such precious words he gave him to his mother and said, Look, your son is alive. Do you see? If we see blessing into a situation of curse, now we see life into a situation of death, the life given by God's word. And of course, this is a one-off miracle here, but in the New Testament, we get these words. Jesus says in John 5, verse 24, very truly, I tell you, whoever hears my word and believes him who sent me has eternal life and will not be judged, but has crossed over from death to life. In other words, the word of the Lord, which brings life in Elijah's day, is the same word of the Lord that brings life for us today. Now, of course, God is a God of miracles. He can do the miraculous. He can intervene supernaturally and bring healing and blessing and even raise people from the dead today. But let's be clear. He has not promised that he will do that in every situation. But what he has promised is that if we trust in him and his word, there is eternal life. Far better than life now, only to die again, but life when you will never die again. Life in the new creation beyond the grave. By grace, as we believe in the words of Jesus Christ, God wonderfully brings to us blessings and life. Now, the blessings of knowing him, forgiveness of sins, adoption as children, every blessing, in, every spiritual blessing in Christ, and the wonderful gift of life now and eternal life in the future in a perfect world where there'll be no famine and there'll be no crime and there'll be no death. That word brings life. And look at verse 23. Can you imagine the scene? He gave him to his mother the joy, the rejoicing, life. How is this possible? Well, look, Elijah strangely did something a bit odd. He stretched himself out over the boy three times and cried out to the Lord so that he might have life. And you think, that's a bit odd. Why does he do that? Well, odder still is that on the cross, Jesus Christ stretched himself out and cried out to the Lord, Father, forgive them for they do not know what they are doing. And by so doing, he offers us life. You see here, Elijah has to obey God and God works through Elijah to bring blessing and life. Jesus Christ is the ultimate Elijah who obeyed God, obedient even to the point of death, death on a cross, so that we might know God's blessing, so that we might experience life. Jesus experienced the curse of God, so we might have the blessing of God. Jesus experienced death on the cross, so that we might have life. 
And as he died, just as the Gentile woman said, now I know that you are a man of God, in verse 24, what happened when Jesus died? A centurion stood at the foot of the cross, a Gentile like the woman, a non-Jew, and he said, surely this man was the Son of God. You see how it works? The word of the Lord that brought blessing and life then is the same word of the Lord that brings blessing and life today. Let me just end by applying this in two brief ways. The sometimes strangeness of God's word. It is strange the things that Elijah is asked to do here, isn't it? And I don't know about you, but as a Christian, sometimes I read God's word and I think it is strange that I'm asked to believe that. Life to come in a new creation, a new world, really? It sounds too strange and too wonderful to be true. It is true because, hallelujah, Christ is risen. Obeying God's word when it looks culturally implausible because we're Western society and we're modern and we've moved on from such antiquated notions? No, the word of the Lord endures. Believe it even when it seems strange. Perhaps for you, the claim that the cross, a place of death, is the ultimate place of life looks strange. But if you obey it, if you believe it, you will find that it's true. Perhaps for you, the call to be a witness in your workplace, to be salt and light, looks strange when everyone around you and HR are telling you to clam up and keep your faith to yourself. Will you go with the culture or will you go with God's word? The sometimes strangeness of God's word and lastly, the seemingly solitary walk of following God. Notice also that Elijah does all this alone. No one with him, just a few ravens. That must have been a bit odd. And there he is, all alone, alone in a foreign land in Sidon. Faith can seem sometimes in a secular age like we're all alone, like we're the minority. Maybe you are the only Christian in office. Maybe you have the privilege of, you know, having a few other Christians, but you're still in the minority. And yet Elijah, of course, was not alone. And my friend, if you trust in Christ, neither are you. Because God was with Elijah every step of the way. And so Elijah obeyed God, and God turned the situation around and brought blessing into a situation of curse and brought life into a place of death. That is what God always does. Let me lead us in a prayer. Father God, thanks for the example of Elijah here, and thank you for the way that, the, um, that Elijah points to the Lord Jesus Christ, the one who ultimately obeyed your word, and by doing so, brought us blessing and life. Help us, wherever we're coming from this morning, to trust him and to trust his word, to do what it says, and to trust that you are a gracious God who wants to bless us and give us eternal life through Jesus Christ. And we ask it for his namesake. Amen.